It looks like we're finally coming to the end of quarantine, and while we're all planning to go out and do things again, I think it's also worth looking back at all the time we spent locked up at home without any toilet paper. I think it's fair to say that most of us picked up some kind of new hobby, interest, or thing. And during that time, for me, that's been a greater interest in film, which has become a gradually increasing interest in history and theory. Now recently I've decided that I want to begin an actual disciplined attempt to seriously self-teach myself as much as I can about film. Like many people, I went on YouTube to try and learn, but I was surprised to see how little content there is on film. Sure, there's a bunch of reviewers and reactors out there, but how many YouTubers really talk about film in a more academic way instead of just unboxing Funko Pops? I mean, you have the PBS Crash Course series, and then you have a couple different channels that talk about theory, like Every Frame of Painting, which is now dead, that's proving my point, or Film Crit Hulk. But there really isn't much in-depth content out there. Uh, I'm completely unqualified for the task myself. I mean, I haven't been to film school, I'm not a filmmaker, I've never been on a movie set. But I'm going to try my best to learn what I can and communicate, communicate that in a way that is accurate and transparent, meaning there will be sources in the description. So what we're going to do is spotlight an old film or filmmaker and then talk about their influence, impact, or whatever relevant theory we can talk about. Now the oldest film is probably the Round Hay Garden scene shot in 1888. We'll talk about that later uh, in another video. But I'd like to talk about some predecessors. And before movies, we of course had photos. And the only problem was that old photosensitive chemicals sucked and required really long exposure times to take a good impression. And the exposure time being how long the photo film needs to be exposed to light. So, for example, the view from the window at Les Gras, taken in 1827. Uh, if you look at the photo, it looks like shadows are being cast in multiple directions simultaneously. That's because the photo took so long that it captured changing light conditions, and it took at least eight hours and possibly several days to get adequate exposure. And fun fact, photofilm didn't even exist at the time. What you're looking at was actually captured using a pewter plate treated with a solution of bitumen of Judea, which is a naturally occurring photosensitive asphalt and lavender oil. And movies were obviously impossible when we had such primitive technology. But gradually, our photography techniques improved, and you had people like Louis Daguerre and his Daguerre process that brought down exposure time more and more. Not to mention the actual quality of the photos improved, because if you go back and look at the window at Les Gras, as you can tell, it was a blurry mess. As the capabilities of photography grew, projecting photos to create some kind of show was basically inevitable. Humans have had a fascination with projected image shows for as long as we've been able to do it. I mean, shadow puppets are one thing. But we've also had the ancient camera obscura, which developed into the magic lantern of the 17th century. These were painted slides, not photos, and they weren't animated, just a series of stills. Which isn't to say that they weren't sophisticated for their day, I mean, these people had full 4D viewing experiences. Phantasmagoria shows would feature everything from smells, electric shocks, and even getting super high before the show. They were even sold as literal seances with the dead by confidence men. Seriously, if, if any of this sounds interesting to you, Atten Shea Films, who I don't have any affiliation with, has a great video on this called When Movies Were Magic. So if you want to learn more about that, go check out that video, but only after you're done with this one. So what we're actually going to talk about today is the Janssen Revolver, developed in 1874 by Pierre Janssen. Janssen was inspired by the design principles of the Colt Revolver, and decided to apply the same design principles to a camera that would rapidly take a series of images. Sort of like using burst mode to take photos on your iPhone, but worse. I mean, for one thing, portability. When I say Janssen revolver, you're probably thinking of, you know, a revolver, a pistol, something you can hold in your hand. But look at this photo. That budget Karl Marx seated in the middle is Janssen, and the giant telescope behind them is actually the Janssen revolver. It's more of a Janssen cannon, if you ask me. <laughs> now, there are plenty of websites I looked at to get a gist on a kind of Wikipedia-level understanding of the Janssen revolver. But the best sources I found, and the main ones I relied on, were a series of articles in the Journal for the History of Astronomy, which I found in Wikipedia's list of references. Links will be in the description. The big one was Jules Janssen's Revolver Photographique, 
and its British derivative, The Jansen Slide, written by Peter Hingley and Francois Launay. Launay in particular seems to have devoted most of her studies to Jansen. So, some background on the Jansen revolver. It was invented to track an astronomical event called the Transit of Venus. The Transit of Venus is a fairly interesting event where Venus and the Earth line up with the Sun. It's like a lunar eclipse, but because Venus is way further away than the Moon, it only appears as a small dot on the Sun's surface instead of covering the Sun entirely. The weird thing about Venus transits is that they appear in pairs 8 years apart, and then after that you have to wait either 105 years or 121 years for the next one. So there was a transit in 1874 and one in 1882. The next one was in 2004 and after that in 2012. And these events were incredibly important because by measuring the transit of Venus, scientists could determine the length of the astronomical unit, the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And we later use near-Earth asteroids, and nowadays we use radar and dynamic parallax to determine that unit. Many astronomers of the 19th century sought to study this, and it was for this purpose Janssen devised his Janssen revolver, which was actually more highly regarded in England than his native France. I'm going to read a passage from the Journal for the History of Astronomy that describes the invention he proposed. The instrument he imagined was intended to take a series of images at short, regular, and adjustable intervals during the period surrounding the four contacts. Jansen suggested a device that would accommodate 180 images. The disc would turn by means of a system driven by an electric current interrupted each second by a clock pendulum. A rotating disc shutter with adjustable slit width would allow the exposure time to be adjusted. Similar photographic devices had already been invented. To summarize from the journal, a Mr. Thompson from England developed a more pistol-like device that could take four photos in a sequence, which he dubbed the Revolver Photographique, which was bought and manufactured by Monsieur A. Briois... Briois... Monsieur Abriois. And there was Thomas Scaife's pistol graph. Jansen had finished a practice model of his new device, which he also called the Revolver Photographique, by the 6th of July, 1874. Now, the camera took daguerreotypes, which by 1874 was an outdated photographic process, but were chosen because they believed that daguerreotypes would be a better choice to capture the transit of Venus specifically. But instead of an electric current, the device ran on a clockwork mechanism, the first version of which had been developed by Eugene Deschiennes... Deschiennes? in 1873. But Janssen complained that it caused too much vibration, so in 1874 Antoine Radier developed a new one which used a Maltese cross system to turn the discs that's very similar to how modern movie projectors work. Basically a Maltese cross system involves a drive wheel and a driven wheel. The drive wheel has a pin which slots into the driven wheel at a specific point in its rotation to cause a stop and start motion in the driven wheel, and that's how the parts move. The revolver had two discs, one that had the photosensitive daguerreotype plates, and a second that functioned as the shutter. These two discs could be manually adjusted to change the exposure times and intervals between exposures. There were more people responsible for the development of the revolver than Jansen himself, and difficulties in deciding the specifics of its construction, but we'll move on and get to its actual use in the field. Again, check out the links below if you want more about the details of its construction. After testing successful prototypes on practice plates, Jansen was ready for the December transit of Venus. After nearly sinking in two typhoons while crossing the South China Sea, Jansen and his crew arrived in Japan. In case of bad weather, Jansen had his team split up. His group would go to Nagasaki, and another group went to Kobe. The man behind the camera in Nagasaki was actually a Brazilian. Francisco Antonio de Almeida officially sent as an attaché to the Janssen expedition, something which was hotly debated in Brazil, as many back home saw it as a pointless, extravagant expense, resulting in satirical illustrations like this. The imagery actually reminds me of Trip to the Moon, oddly enough. And we see that all the people involved in this are tinkerers and astronomers, not artists. I think we should give fair dues to the nerds of history that developed the field of chronophotography and acknowledge that without the skill of engineers and naturalists, we pretentious liberal arts types wouldn't have the motion pictures we love to analyze nowadays. But anyway, enough talking. How about we actually watch the movie? Wow. Thrilling, right? 
except that likely wasn't actually the footage of Venus crossing the sun seen that day. The disc that was believed to hold the Nagasaki photos had been donated to the conserva- The disc that was believed to have hold the Nag- the disc that was believed to hold the Nagasaki photos had been donated to the Conservatoire National des Arts et Métiers by Janssen's daughter Antoinette in 1921. However, Francois Launay closely compared this disc to the photos of known practice discs and revealed that this disc was also a practice disc. It seems that the actual Nagasaki and Kobe photos have been lost to time, just like 80 to 90 percent of silent films. The genuine Nagasaki and Kobe discs are just gone. But to soften the blow of that revelation, at least we can say that these photos that have been lost proved essential to measuring the parallax back in the day, right? Well, no. Supposedly, the photos taken in Japan turned out to be unusable for astronomical purposes and inferior to contemporary observations by the human eye. However, Janssen did show his invention around, and it did see some use in the wider field of chronophotography to capture sequences of motion. Now, to make up for this downer, admittedly disappointing ending, next time we'll talk about a man who died in obscurity after destroying his life's work. So, subscribe if you want to hear about that, and hit the bell if you want YouTube to actually notify you when it comes out, because that's apparently how YouTube works now. I'll talk to you then.